Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. We're going to pick it up here in chapter 44 with verse 17 in a moment. You know, this is, a, this is one of the most fantastic chapters in the Word of God. That it lets us have a look at what transpires in the very millennium itself. And how precious that is that uh, the millennium... Uh, Let's us know what transpires, but come with me though. All people, even those that didn't make it, are transformed into spiritual bodies. What? For discipline and to wait the day of judgment when God judges all. And for, by what? Well, how does he judge them? From the book of life. Your record, it's all right there. When you repent, that that is evil is washed away, and uh, that that is good always remains. Um, so having said that, we understood that most of the priests went astray when Israel did. They were called the Levitical priesthood. But then there was the priest of the Zadok, which is a Hebrew word that means the elect or the just. And we're going to pick it up speaking of them. They can approach the prince and the Messiah during the millennium. No one else can. And the remainder of this chapter will let you fill you in and let you know exactly what transpires. So chapter 44, verse 17, let's pick it up there and let's go with it. And it reads, And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court, and within. In other words, um, what, well, what clothing is this? Well, of course, it's, uh, it's the very righteous acts uh, the, and clothing that we wear even in the eternal kingdom. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This is the clothes. Fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is, what, what is it? What's it made from? It is the righteousness of the saints. In other words, it's the righteous acts of the saints that forms the linen and gives them the position or place uh, as the Zadok in the heavenly kingdom. And this is the clothing that must be owned when you approach Messiah. That, that's what it's about. Verse 18, returning to the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, it reads, They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and shall have linen breeches and upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. And there's not going to be any sweat there. Everything is cool. Everything is refreshing. And there's no tension whatsoever, because that is the king, and you're in the kingdom. And as God's elect, you have that right to be right there with him in following orders to instruct all that would listen. Verse 19, and when they go forth into the utter court, that's to say the outer court, even into the outer court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers, that's the little chambers around the holy place, and they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Uh, and so those righteous acts are not to be shared through this period of time. Well, you've got a lot of people out there that didn't make it. They're raised in spiritual bodies, but they still have a mortal soul, meaning liable to die if they don't participate in the second resurrection. So uh, how precious it is to come to this place and for God to share with us 
exactly how it's going down. Verse 20, Neither shall they sh uh, shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. In other words, they're going to be neat, well-trimmed, well-groomed, looking good. 21, Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. That's a no-no. Verse 22, Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. Now, you, you have to come with me again. We're in spiritual bodies. You're not going to have weddings as you have weddings today. We're talking about the many-membered body of Christ, and the wedding is with Christ. Okay, It just simply happens that the Zadok make up part of that many-membered body of Christ. And you have to think of that. They're right there with him. They're serving him. They're ministering to him and to the people as he ministers. Verse 23, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane. Do you want to know what's taught in the millennium? Do you want to know what those priests are doing in the millennium in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5? They teach between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's discipline. And that is taught in the millennium whereby hopefully they can latch on to that discipline, hang on to it, treasure it, and be pleasing to Almighty God and those people around them. Verse 24, And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. Now, this is one of the only places where it speaks of God, of anyone judging other than God and the Son. But here as the elect or that member, but notice they judge according to God's law, which is a form of discernment, which you even use today. It's a gift of God. But here, when you are teaching the difference between the holy and the profane and teaching with discipline, then certainly there will be a certain amount of judgment in that. Why? If they go wrong now, they're going into the fire, the lake of fire. And if we can prevent that, I mean, it's our brothers, our sisters, and anything we can do to help and um, in that teaching, we're going to do it. It's your destiny. 25. And they shall come at no dead person. That means everybody's in spiritual bodies. What does it mean, dead person? Spiritually dead. They did not overcome in the first resurrection. You can come at no dead person to defile themselves, but, oh, here's an exception, but for father or for mother or for son, or for daughter, for brother, or for sister that hath had no husband, they may defile themselves. In other words, when it comes to that fact, that you can, if you have a loved one of that category, that fits in that category, you can go help them. You're going to pay a little bit of a price for it. But well, why would you want to, to help them out, to get their act together? to give them knowledge and wisdom that they evidently do not possess, and to try to get them to get their act together and to overcome. But at the same time, what does that particular verse do? That particular verse documents that inasmuch as God said, let us create man in our image, that everyone looks as they look. Therefore, naturally, how could you help a mother, father, brother, or sister if you didn't recognize them? Well, naturally, you do recognize them. Why? Because they're your kin. They're your family. Though we would all be at the same age in spiritual bodies, you would still recognize them. This is your documented proof of it. Many people have lost loved ones that have gone on before them. You're going to see them again. You're going to recognize them in the millennium you're going to be with them. 
And this is your documented proof from the very Word of God. I don't care what language you translate it in, it still says the same thing. It still means the same thing. But again, as I stated, there is a penalty. Many will ask me, well, why does it say a sister that hath had no husband? Because when two marry, they become one flesh, and therefore uh, she, it would fall to a different family. I'm sure God would still allow. Verse 26, and after he is cleansed, this is the penalty you pay, after he is cleansed from being with that dead person spiritually, they shall reckon unto him seven days. It's going to take seven days away from Messiah, seven days before you can put on those holy garments again of the righteous acts, seven days of purification after having touched the dead, spiritually dead. And that's a, that's a low price to pay, though, for helping someone you really love. It's time well spent. I mean, we're not going anywhere. We're in the millennium. And if you're truly one of God's elect, you're there to assist, to help, and, and to um, lend knowledge and wisdom and guidance to those that need it. That's, that's your com the compassion that God puts in the Zadok or God's elect. That's one of the ways you can always identify one of God's elect. They have compassion. Verse 27, And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary into the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. And what is the sin offering, dear? To, because he did touch the, those that were spiritually dead, is love. Love is the sacrificial offering given in the millennium. Given to who? To, to the Messiah. He that paid the price so that we can have salvation, so we can teach salvation, so we can present salvation to whomsoever will. Verse 28, And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. You understand this? Not as old Esau that didn't care about his inheritance. It shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance and ye shall give them no possession in Israel, I am their possession. That's really a hard one to latch on to. God himself is your inheritance, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all things. God owns all things. Therefore, inasmuch as you inherit him, then you inherit all that is his. And the reason they don't need to give you an allotment in Israel of land or anything else, because wherever you step, you own it all. And not that it will mean that to you, but that is the actual fact. And you will never use that to overlord on anyone or anything else. You know, maybe this lets it, lets it be better understood when he, when Jesus taught to the only two churches out of seven he was happy with. So you want to make sure when you attend a church that part of their framework, their basic teaching, has to do with what Smyrna and Philadelphia taught. If they're not, you're in a heap of hurt. Well, what did Smyrna teach? He, and, and you can read it in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first, the last, which was dead and is alive, that's to say the Lord Jesus Christ. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. You're, you're poor in a sense, but thou art rich. Well, how are they rich? Because they possess the living God. He is their inheritance. Well, what is it they're doing? And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are of your brother Judah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. In other words, the Kenites that claim to be our brother Judah and they're lying about it. Does your church teach that? If they don't, you're in a heap of hurt because you're going to have trouble identifying the false Messiah. Fear none of those things which, shall, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. In other words, delivered up so the Holy Spirit can speak through you to the world. And you shall have tribulation ten days, and ten days only. That's no step for a stepper. You can cut it. 
Be thou faithful unto death, I will give thee the crown of life. In other words, you inherit the living God. You are rich. Regardless of what your condition is on earth. Because God, Yahweh, the creator of all, is your inheritance. It, friend, it doesn't get any better than that. If you want to try to get a taste for it, some, some night when it's clear and you look up at the at the immense universe of stars and the heavens, the planets and the earth, the sun and the moon. Naturally, you're not going to see the sun at night unless you're in certain places. But understand it belongs to your father. He created it and what he has created is yours also. It's an awesome, awesome thought. Talk about a very humbling thought that humbles you right to, the, right to your knees to know and to love the Father that thinks enough of you because you have eyes to see and ears to hear to know and to follow Him that you are worthy of such an inheritance. How fantastic it is. Maybe you can at the same time better understand why God hated Esau who hated that inheritance. But then that's the way some are, and Esau happened to be of that type. Then returning to Ezekiel 44, next verse, 29, please. They shall eat the meat offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering, and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. Every devoted thing in Israel that is given concerning our Father is theirs. And they do inherit it. It is theirs. You know, again, this takes us into the millennium. It began back in the 40th chapter. And it's letting you know what they do in heaven, so to speak. Only we're still in the millennium age, the day of the Lord. A little bit of different as it will be in the eternal kingdom, which comes into track on, in Revelation chapter 21. But here, come with me to this point so that you better uh, <clears throat> understand <clears throat> the events transpiring. Verse 30. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. You shall also give unto the priest the fast of first of your dough, that he may cause the, the blessing to rest in thine house. And so it is. It doesn't get any better than that, my friend. All in compassion, all in family, so to speak, the very family of God. As that great wedding, as those righteous acts weave together, the hardships you may have gone through and the price you paid weaving that garment together of righteous acts in these flesh bodies, taking forth the word of God, standing against the false one, earning that right, though you may be poor, even in poverty, yet in him you're rich. It doesn't get any better than to inherit Almighty God and all that he has created and all that he owns and to be considered a part of it. That's what's most important, is the fact that you can exercise compassion, uh, needs and helpfulness to all whosoever will. Verse 31, to complete the chapter, the priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast, whether it be poultry or, and or otherwise. Only that, that is properly, why? It's unhealthy, that's why. You, you must always properly bleed an animal uh, as uh, we are instructed in the books of the law. Why? Because we, these flesh bodies require clean food. If you do not eat clean food, you're going to be sick. And you can't very well serve God if you are ill. Uh, that is to say, uh, I don't want, this does not, has nothing to do with handicapped people. Many handicapped people set a far better image before Christ than I could ever uh, do because the very fact to the unbeliever 
to be handicapped and still love the Lord sets an awesome example. And so it is. God has a purpose and a means for everything. So how precious it is serving the living God. Now, we come to chapters that go into the disbursement of land. I'm going to take you there. We're going to go to the fourth verse of chapter 45 of this great book. And let's pick up on what we're going to be discussing. The holy portion of the land, and that's what we're going to be doing is land allotments, shall be for the priest, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to minister unto the Lord, and it shall be a place for their houses and an holy place for the sanctuary. In other words, when I point out to you in a moment the sanctuary, this is the place that the Zadok will actually exist. I'm going to skip on to the 8th verse of that 45th chapter. And that 8th verse reads concerning the tribes. In the, land shall, in the land shall be his possession in Israel. And my princes shall no more oppress my people. They're going to have their own. And the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. And I want to reiterate, according to their tribes. Now, as I've always taught you, a picture speaks a thousand words. So therefore, we're going to go to a picture. And as you notice, so always to the north, Dan is always the furthest north tribe. And we have Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, the largest, Reuben, and then the tribe of Judah. Now here we have the Levitical area, and here you have the area of the sanctuary. This is a one-mile square right here. And, um, and this is for the priests. There's the city, the fields of that, and the prince's domain. These would be about 24 miles across, each of these uh, domains of the prince. And... But this is where it all happens. Right here in this sanctuary is the beautiful place of God. And then below that, where you have Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes that kind of are nearest and that separate. But just south of the city, you have Benjamin, Simeon, and Issachar, Zebulun, Gad. And there you have the 12 tribes in the allotment of land. That is the very picture of how it is laid out. And that speaks a thousand words, whether we could read all these dimensions and all these measurements, but that gets you exactly where we're at and what it's talking about and how precious it is. Our Father, I, I want to simply reiterate one thing. Nobody's going to control anybody's property. Everybody controls their own property. And that goes for even the priest of the Zadok. Nobody's going to control that property other than they themselves, as God has given them that right. But that sanctuary, which I showed you earlier, a picture of it, of how the layout of it is, even down to the outer gates, which has the seven steps, then coming into the inner gates, which you have eight steps, Steps, which means up into new beginnings. And that entire uh, picture I showed you of that temple, the sanctuary, is one-seventh larger than the Temple of Solomon, which leads on to the seventh and then the eighth, which again would be new beginnings. And our Father and the Son are the temple thereof in that eternity. What a precious time to live in this age when these things are just before us, they're right at the door because we are in the generation of the fig tree. And uh, all prophecy was to happen in and to that generation. Now, um, chapters uh, 45, the remainder, 46, the allotment and uh, offerings, and, uh, which is covered by the picture I just showed you. I think it's more meaningful and that way you're able to understand the layout that God will have in the millennium. That entire width is about 60 to 70 miles. 
by about 50 miles width, but it's all concentrated right in that place we call Mount Zion. It is there that that sanctuary will be situated and our, what a he heavenly thing. Remember Christ's words as he would leave Jerusalem the last time at the first advent. He said, watch these buildings. Not one stone will left, be left standing atop another. It's going to be prepared for that temple and that land allotment you just observed. So for the people of the living God. And all whomsoever will, will come there to worship at that time. Now, we're going to skip on to the 47th chapter. And, um, and here we, have, we begin to have teaching again concerning the tribes. But there you have the allotment, how it will be fixed, and nobody will interfere with that. And nobody will try to possess anyone else's land. So, having said that, um, we have the land allotment exactly as the tribes are laid out and the place of worship for whomsoever will through the millennium. The eternal temple will be somewhat different, but be that as it may. Chapter 47, verse 1, the great book of Ezekiel, verse 1 reads, Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, this is the temple itself, sanctuary, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, going to the east gate, okay? And the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. In other words, it comes right out from under the altar of God. Well, what is this? It's spiritual. But you know what is amazing? If you're a student of God's Word, you know that that stone that uh, was struck, stricken twice by Moses when it was only supposed to be once provided water for all of Israel while they were in the desert. And even King James that arranged th this King James Bible his coronation took place over that stone, the stone of scone. And that stone will still be there, and that spiritual water will still pour forth from it. That's why it's important that you watch and observe history. I know that these words upset certain people. That's okay. Hey, truth is still truth, and if you uh, want to doubt, well, just, just doubt, but stick around. You'll find it. that's exactly how it will be, exactly. And there that spiritual water pours forth. This is God's way of managing the land allotment we just covered, plus all the children otherwise all over the world, all that ever have been, as they worship the living God because all that remain at that time shall worship him, or they won't be. Next verse, please. Verse 2. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without un, unto the utter gate, the outer gate, by the way that looked eastward. This is the, the gate where the sacrifices were brought in. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And, uh, and so it is, uh, verse 3. And when the man that had the line in his hand, this is the one doing the measurements and the allotments, he went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, And he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. I, I, could, I could muster that. I could manage it pretty good. And remember the thousand years that we were in, we have a thousand cubits here to go with it. And again, verse 4, again he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. And again he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters were to the loins. Five. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, and waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. In other words, I could not cross it. 
as of my tribe and everything else, I could not cross that river, a spiritual river. It's a division, a boundary, a border. <clears throat> and, and so it is. This is our Father's way of, um, uh, of uh, handling things. You might say, well, well, how would the Lord handle that? He walked on the water. No problem whatsoever. But man could not do that. And so it is. God has a way. He sets the boundaries thereof. Even the boundaries we just observed in the land allotment of Israel, those boundaries are set. Verse 6, And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Look at it. Look at that water. Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. He took me right back to the lip of it. 7, Now I had returned. Behold, at the bank, or the lip of the river, were very many trees on the one side and the other. There were trees for food on both sides. But he, he couldn't cross it. But others could. They were there. Again, this is spiritual. It's not actual H2O we're talking about here. Know and understand and learn. We're in the millennium. you got to come with me. It is God's way. And, and God's way is, believe it or not, the way it's going to be. Verse 8, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert. Do you know what's in the east country there? The Mount of Olives. And go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And, and uh, so they are healed. And uh, salt for healing. How precious it is that our Father leads, guides, and directs, but also he shares all this information with us that we have that truth and that knowledge to understand even how it will be not only in this earth age, but the millennium which is knocking on the door when we see God's way of recovering and giving an opportunity to all in spiritual bodies that might not have been able to even learn in the flesh. But in that spiritual body have no um, infringements that would prevent them from having 100% recall to learn and to know and to understand you're going to love the Father or you're going to love Satan's ways. It's up to you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We don't judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. And until we get to the millennium, that's the way it will remain. You have the right to practice the gift of God called spiritual discernment. That simply allows you to know who you should fellowship with, who you should study with, what you should do, and so forth. It's a gift from God, and it always is a blessing. It certainly is. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, it's always a pleasure. Now, Prayer request, you don't need a number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He does. He loves you. You may not love what you do always.
but he does love you. That's why he created you the way you are. You're unique, and he wants you to stay that way, to love him, returning the love whereby he can bless you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Wayne from New Mexico. Does the party that has been going on, does the tea party that has been going on in this country, is it the deadly wound? Absolutely not. It gives life. It um, is the American people exercising their rights and their liberties. You know, we have, it's, it's a great thing to be in a nation where you don't have to have permission to travel from one coast to the other. You can just go. Do you understand how rare that is? There's many, many countries you cannot do that. You have to have permission and clearance. Um, and uh, because why? You're not free. But here we have those freedoms. And when anyone begins to encroach upon those freedoms, then the people are going to sound off, and they certainly will. That's what the Tea Party is all about, symbolic of the old Tea Party of all, old. And <clears throat> what happened there? Lawrence from Georgia. My sister-in-law was kicked out of her church when she refused to help cook or serve plates or help them with rummage sales. Isn't this wrong? Well, if that's, if that's the only reason, then yes, that is wrong. Because uh, cooking and rummage sales are not part of worshiping the living God. If they, I, I would assume that if there was a rightful cause and it was for a good reason and she had been approached and asked and thanked for the service afterwards, she probably would have done it. So there's got to be more to the story and so, but to simply be kicked out for those reasons would be wrong. But I won't judge. That's just discernment. Mary from Pennsylvania. In Ezekiel 18.22, the Companion Bible says there is no holding. What does that mean? I'm going to use the word holding because I would be judging a religion to say otherwise. But I, I think you need to realize that um, to, what it's talking about is that if you sin rather than having to pay uh, some uh, penance for having sinned, if you just repent, you say, I don't want to hear about it again. It's over. It's done with. I forgive you. Don't want to hear about it again. And so, therefore, naturally, there's no place where penance is paid when you repent. Uh, Gene from Wisconsin, where in the Bible does it mention the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Um, it, you'll find it in Daniel chapter 11, where one is basically over the Ptolemaic, and in other words, we'll, I'll give the nations of today, Iran and Egypt, and over those areas of land, um, one being the north and the other being the south. Elizabeth from Washington. On your program, you said there was a man created on the sixth day and the seventh day. Was the implication a racial one? Is that correct? Well, they were different races, if that's what you mean. That's certainly not a, a racial uh, implication. It's a fact, uh, which is, you know, a lot of people like to say, for example, that the black race came from an incestuous affair of uh, him and his and and uh, his mother. They claim uh, they don't understand that uncovering your father's nakedness, as it is written in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11, is un uncovering your father's nakedness is not looking at his naked body, it's sleeping with his wife, your mother. And uh, that doesn't change your, your race. That's why it wasn't God that drove Canaan away, it was Noah, because Noah Canaan wasn't Noah's son, it was Ham's son by Noah's wife. Um, and to say that that's where the black race came from is, is pitiful. Okay. Because God created all the races on the sixth day and he looked and it was good. He loved them, he still does. And um, 
but he didn't, he rested the seventh day and then he created, if you could read the Hebrew manuscripts, it's this very simple thing. On the sixth day, he created Adam. On the eighth day, he created Eth Ha'adam, through which Christ would come. Frank from Pennsylvania, when Satan comes, how will we know, what will we do, and will God help us? Well, that, that's what God's Word is all about. We know that Satan comes claiming to be what? Christ. That's why they call him instead of Christ or Antichrist. Anti in the Greek means instead of, not anti like antifreeze. It means instead of Christ. Why? Because he's a fake. He's a phony. He always wanted to be Messiah. He wanted to sit on the mercy seat to take it over rather than protect it. <clears throat> that was his downfall. So the whole world will be clamoring that Christ has returned. The sad part is they haven't read the letter God sent them because that happens at the sixth trump. You know, a child can count to six. And a child can count to seven because the true Christ doesn't return until the seventh trump. Betty from Virginia, please tell me where the gulf is talked about in the Bible. I, I think I get that question almost uh, top ranking. Luke chapter 16, the gulf, you know, you know, Luke was a surgeon. And this gulf is a laceration, okay, uh, a medical term for it. It means you can't cross over it. Um, when, you, when you part and die from in these flesh bodies, if you haven't repented of any of your sins, they're all listed in the book of life. You're certainly not going to go to the side the throne is on. You're going to the side opposite that is for holding those until the millennium when things will be different. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, that's where you'll find it. Okay, and Richard from Michigan, where in the Bible does it say we have to have a marriage ceremony and a state license? Well, it, that's a civil law. Many of, our, many of our laws are based on that. That's what Social Security is about. If you, if you want your children to have that insurance that you've worked very hard for, uh, then certainly uh, you should have a civil marriage and uh, done naturally by your pastor or, or your church or however, what, whatever your affiliation. Uh, that makes it legal in the government sense and we have a beautiful nation. It's a blessed nation. And your rights as a citizen with insurance and many other things uh, you rob your children of if you do not have that uh, accuracy or the correct um, method in which you do this. All childbearing people should be married with a state license. <clears throat> That's only common sense. Uh, Joel from Ohio, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, please explain. Because, because justice or a just sentence is delayed in being fulfilled, it, um, it, uh, brings, uh, it brings on more evil. In other words, if you're going to hang somebody, do it. Get it over with so that people can remember and see. Like the old boy that just um, murdered that, those uh, mother and those two daughters, he shouldn't sit there and wait and be repealed and all this. He's by, judged by peers. He should be executed or whatever form and get him on up to the father because those girls are waiting for him. He, his, his trial doesn't even start till he gets there. And I think you can probably imagine what's going to go on. Uh, but it, what it means is, is don't delay while it's still fresh on the mind. Do it so others will see and fear and these things will cease happening among you. Uh, Nora from Missouri. In Revelations 21.1, it states the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, but I thought this was the second heaven and earth. Can you please help me with this? Well, it is. And that's how it is. But what it's talking about here 
It's simply the age that passes away, not the irrets or the terra firma, because what it's saying is not that we have a new earth in that verse, but this one is rejuvenated. It's reclaimed. God, God, Romans chapter 8, where it says the very creature itself, which is the creation, groans for that advent where God makes that correction. That is the verse in which this earth is put back in its original form before the overthrow of Satan, where true north is the same as magnetic north, not 90 miles off with wobbling earthquakes, um, jet streams, storms. The firmament goes back and protects the earth. And we have fertile soil from the north to the south pole. Uh, what a beautiful planet when we have uh, those conditions. Brenda from North Carolina. I, if I am to discern in order to be fed by a preacher who teaches God's word, what is the difference in discern and judge? Well, to, to discern is to analyze. What Does he really teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse? Does, does he explain what God has to say or does he say what he has to say? You don't have to listen to a person very long and you can, you can discern spiritually where he's coming from. He might say, well, let's do something holy and pass the hat about three times through this meeting. If that's all he's going to talk about, well, our roof needs this and this. He never teaches God's word. It's always money, money, money. Guess where his mind is? Guess what his object is? It's money, 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 money. Okay. If it's teaching God's word, I'm, I, maybe that's a bad um, example to set forth, but I think that gets it said. That's spiritual discernment, is to know, are they teaching God's Word or are they pulling your leg? Okay? This just doesn't, it isn't very difficult to figure out. Lester from Louisiana. What are all of the names of Satan and where can I find this in the Bible? Well, there's no place you will find every last one of them in one place, but there is a couple of places where you can get a pretty good list of them. One would be in Revelation chapter 12, it gives you Satan, the old dragon, the serpent, the devil. And, and, and um, then as the chapter continues, it will break it down to serpent and so forth uh, with a title of basically how he served each one of those um, titles. But, but he also is Antichrist. That's a role he plays. He plays the role of false prophet. And those offices are taken away from him right at the beginning of the millennium and destroyed. He's never going to have them again. He's never going to come as Antichrist a second time. He comes as himself when he's released from the abyss for a short season. In the great book of Daniel, he is called the, the um, little horn in one place. He's called the vile person in the book of Daniel, chapter 11. In Isaiah, chapter 11, he is called Lucifer, which is morning star. Why? Because Christ is the true morning star, son of the morning. He claims he's son of the morning. Always copying and always stealing, always deceiving people that are unlearned in Father's letter. And he catches them off guard tricks them and uses them. He's, he's a dead man walking. You do not want to join him. Lewis from Georgia. Is the date Bible a good Bible? It's, you know, as long as you don't pay a great deal of attention to some of the opinions of um, the tribes, the rapture doctrine, uh, he basically did most of his homework from the companion Bible which is the Bible I recommend as a study Bible, Dakes, Dakes took from the Companion Bible, or I could properly say from, from Bullinger's works, which is good. There's no, nothing wrong with that. Bullinger was, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest Christian, I repeat, Christian scholars that God ever allowed to walk this earth aside from Christ himself, and 
the disciples he hand chose. But in the latter last century, Bullinger was about it. He, he, he was quite frankly the only Christian that Christian Ginsburg, who put together the Masra, which is the original footnotes that came with the Word of God, the manuscripts. Uh, he's the only person, Christian, that uh, Ginsburg would allow to proofread when he was putting together the Masra. Now that's horsepower, my friend. It may not mean a whole lot to you, but to a scholar of God's Word, it means a lot. Because uh, proofreading the Masra there uh, wouldn't be a handful of people that would be qualified to do that. Bullinger was. Dakes took from him, and, and that's fine. But Dakes' commentary on the rapture and the tribes will get you in trouble. Uh, but, but no problem. Good work. Doran from Florida. If the first earth age was destroyed, when did all the nation, where did all the nations come from? How, how America is only 200 years old, this nation is, um, uh, and the, this earth age is about 6,000 years old. So how long do you think it takes to build a nation? And this nation happens to be, though it's, uh, it's a little over 200 years old, a little few years, it's a superpower of superpowers. God can build nations, and then there's little old Egypt that God practiced, said many, many years ago, even before Christ's time. You will always be a base nation, a small nation. It always has been. Other nations come and go, but God promised Egypt would be always a base nation, and so it is. That means never a superpower, but always a nation. Lee from Colorado. Does God have anything to do with what family a soul person is born into? Well, um, God always, you, you always get what you have coming to you. I feel that. But you always, this is the beauty of God's plan. You can always grow out of it. You can always improve. You see, there's really only one family, and that's God's family. And the quicker one realizes that and begins to serve the living God and then falls into the place where God would use them by knowing who they are. That's, that's important. You, you had this one person, because I stated that the races were created, to the, the very ignorance of asking, is that a racial statement? You know, trying to imply that I would be a racist for teaching truth. It is not, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, the races are, are proud, they're each with dignity, respecting each race with dignity. Uh, they're all children of God, and so be it. But God created them that way, and that's the way it is. So maturity is a beautiful thing. God does give us, um, you might say, well, what about a Kenite? Well, they deserve to be born a Kenite because of what they did in the first earth age. But they still have the opportunity to love the Lord Jesus Christ and be converted and become a child of God. Uh, Phil from California. In regards to Matthew 23, 24, are these false Christ and false prophets here already? Can you please expand on this for me? Thank you. I think that has to do with the motive. Don't um, don't you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, uh, or something of that nature? Yeah, there are people today that uh, are not anti-Christ, but they are definitely against Christ, and that's what Christ was saying in that place. Th those are the opposite. Those are the woes that are opposite of the beatitudes in in um, the. Uh, earlier chapters of the book of Matthew, each one of them. Your companion Bible will have a, an appendix on that of aligning the Beatitudes with the woes in chapter 23. It is, what, what he starts out with, with the woes, is 
the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Well, what was Moses? The lawgiver. And they take the law and twist it and turn it and teach it. And do you know something? That's what Satan did. Mm -hmm. Satan tempted Christ with Scripture. Only he tweaked it. He, he took the very end of it and turned it about 45 degrees that made it a lie. But he didn't know his Scripture a lot more than most Christians would. Whether he was pulling their leg, telling the truth, or what, they would have no conception. So that, that's, what, um, that's why you want to be very careful. The scribes and the fairies sit in the seat of Moses, claiming they're great lawyers of God's Word, higher critics. Anytime someone says they're a higher critic, you probably want to keep your hand on your wallet and keep your Bible in your hand and um, keep your belt snugged up real tight, okay? Because you're, you're just about to hear a person that makes his living trying to disprove God's Word. I know that really offends a lot of people, but uh, I do, I, do I look worried? I don't. It's the truth, okay? Charles from Florida. What does wormwood or the term wormwood in the book of Revelation mean? Is it nuclear or, or is, is it the planet? No, wormwood simply means bitterness. And it is true. I, I understand. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, a, I do not speak the Russian tongue, but I understand that Chernobyl is wormwood. Uh, so be that as it may, it means bitterness, though, as far as God's Word. Out of time, God loves you because you enjoy the Word. Most of all, He loves you because you study it, okay? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God, He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me. You stay in His Word every day in His Word. It's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.